this piece, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, is just a joyful explosion of, of fun and, pr and praise. Judy, you can come on up. And then the, and, and we will remember Arliss as one of those people who always had a smile on her face. Then the second piece we will be playing um, after the first hymn is Eternity's Time Piece. And this piece has to do with, well, it's, it, was, it was written for Yellowstone, to depict Yellowstone, but it really is about all our beautiful, God's beautiful nature and the national parks. And if you'll listen, you can hear rainstorms, you can hear serene beauty, and you can see, just hear the glory of God's beautiful world. So we hope you enjoy our bell choir pieces this morning. And uh, this is praise to the Lord, the Almighty, in memory of Arliss Parker. And later you'll hear Eternity's timepiece in memory of Mike Anderson.
of you intravenous caffeine this morning? That was like, oh, whoa. We okay? We okay? Okay. Yeah, I was asking if Gene gave you guys all like a ton of caffeine this morning. You get, or uh, you uh, look like a couple of you grew an extra hand trying to ring all those bells. So I'm, I was killing time while Catherine got her microphone. Here you go. Everyone, good morning. My name is Pastor Catherine. Here we have Pastor Andy, and, and Pastor Charles is on his way back. We pray for him and Judy on our travels. Um, I am going to share our announcements this morning. And our main announcement is uh, just to wish uh, those who have served a happy Veterans Day. If you've served, do you mind raising your hand? Awesome. Let's give them a hand of a, a round of applause. We thank you for your example of courage and sacrifice. Awesome. Well, today uh, we are going to have the chance to sing together for the healing of the nations, which is hymn number 428 or on your screens. Amen. As uh, Jean is making her way over there, I'm going to remind you uh, that uh, we're preaching this whole sermon series is about legacy. I could not think of a more appropriate way uh, for, uh, for us to have our special music today uh, besides to honor uh, two of, our, of the people that we love in this congregation so much. And uh, this one is, is for Mike Anderson, who I think of so often. So I invite you to listen and, and have your hearts be filled.
Amen. Thank you guys so much. I got swept away in that. So uh, I'm going to invite all of our children to come forward now for our children's time. Hello, everybody. How's everybody today? Good. good. It's really good to see you guys this morning. It's been too long. I haven't been able to be here, and I missed you guys. How is everybody? Good? 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 good. Just checking all the way across the line here. Good? Awesome. Well, I want to tell you guys a story this morning about a farmer. And what do farmers usually do? They, they grow things, right? Well, this farmer grew corn. And he loved to grow a lot of corn, and he grew very good corn. And everybody would say, wow, what does he do to have such great corn? And a reporter came by one day from a newspaper and said, we heard about your corn. You keep getting prizes, and you keep getting awards. What's so special about your corn? And he said, oh, my corn grows beautifully because I have the best corn there is to grow. And then they found out that he shares his corn with his neighbors, and they grow corn too. And the reporter said, aren't they going to be competing against you, like when you have a race, and they might win if they have good corn too? And the farmer said, if my corn is good and I help my neighbors have good corn, then their corn is going to pollinate my corn, too, and we'll all have better corn. So what that meant was the farmer liked to share. Come here, babe. The farmer liked to share so that everybody could have the very best corn there was, so the people and the animals that ate that corn could grow big and strong. So what if the farmer had just kept all of the good corn seeds to himself? Do you think that would have worked out very well? No. It was better to help the people around him grow good corn, too. That's kind of what we like to do, right, Candace? Yeah. yeah. We like to share. So when we share from our church, a lot of times we go out into our town and the towns nearby, and we share, and we share our steps, right? And we share where we sit. Yeah, because it's so much nicer to share. And that's something that's really important that churches can do. But each one of you can do it too. So when you have something and you think it's super cool, maybe you can find a way to help share with somebody who doesn't have that thing or who needs something else. And I think we're really good at that here in our church. But we need you guys to do it too. So remember to do that when you can. Think about how nice it is to share. Right now, why don't we share, everybody just share a great big air hug to everybody. Yay! Oh, that's awesome. That makes us all feel warm and loved, and we'll go have a wonderful day and a great week, and I'll see you next time. Awesome. All righty. Well, I am going to share our scripture today, and it is from Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, pick 12 men from the people, one man per tribe. Command them, pick up 12 stones from right here in the middle of the Jordan, where the feet of the priest has been firmly, had been firmly planted. Bring them across with you and put them down in the camp where you are staying tonight. Joshua called for the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one man per tribe. Joshua said to them, cross over the middle of the Jordan, up to the Lord your God's chest. 
Each of you lift up a stone on his shoulder to match the number of tribes of the Israelites. This will be a symbol among you. In the future, your children may ask, what do these stones mean to you? Then you will tell them that the water of the Jordan was cut off before the Lord's covenant chest. When it crossed over the Jordan, the water of the Jordan was cut off. These stones will be an enduring memorial for the Israelites. This is a word of God for the people of God. Will you guys bow with me? God, we thank you so much for, uh, for this chance to be together, and I thank you for this, uh, for this great group of people, and uh, for, God, the call that you put in their lives, uh, for the relationships they have, for the legacy they're leaving, God. I pray that as we spend some time thinking about your word today, uh, that, uh, that you would be growing in us a passion uh, for you and for the legacy uh, that you're calling us to leave. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, once I became a dad and a husband, everything in my life changed. Everything. Before Catherine and I got married, I was living on my own in Lincoln, Nebraska. When I very first moved to Lincoln, I did not know a single person in the whole city. In fact, I don't think I really knew anybody in Nebraska. And I don't think that's too far of an exaggeration, okay? My nearest close connections in life were about three hours away here in the Kansas City area. One of the perks of being an itinerant pastor, which means the bishop can move me anywhere, anytime that the bishop so desires, is that when I get moved, the conference pays for that move, okay? They foot the whole bill. And back then, I had so little stuff uh, that they, they said, we'll throw in for free, we will box up everything you own and just take it. It was great. I had to do nothing. I sat back and watched other people do the work. But after they packed up everything, I watched as all of my worldly possessions left on their way to Lincoln, Nebraska. As the movers drove off, I said my goodbyes to my family there, and I embarked on this new journey. Just the clothes on my back, with just those I arrived about three hours later in Lincoln to my new apartment building. I got the keys and did all of the final checking in, paperwork. When I was done, I was anxious to start off this new leg of my journey. But checking my watch, I was wondering, why hasn't my stuff shown up yet, right? So I call up the moving company. Hey, when are you guys going to get here with my stuff? They said, oh, about three o'clock. On Monday, like, like, on Monday, that's like days away from now, right? Like, what am I supposed to do? I just assumed they were going to pack it up and drive. This is my first time doing this, right? I've never dealt with a moving company. I've always carried my stuff myself. They said, they said oh, yeah, the, yeah, you'll have to wait three days. Okay. So, although this was truly a minor setback, and it was, it wasn't that big of a deal, And a good life lesson, maybe, if you entrust all of your earthly possessions to somebody, at least maybe ask a couple follow-up questions about when they're going to give it back. (laughs) Uh, But it was some. There was something so stark about my first couple of days uh, as a real like career person uh, and this new journey in my life in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I was alone in an apartment, very, very alone. No bed, no furniture. No change of clothes or toothbrush, (laughs) not a single close relationship within 200 miles of me, and that was my life at that point. The stark image of being alone and stripped bare was really a fitting fitting image for that season of my life. I had just finished seminary, my faith was all broken down and jumbled up too. I was in the midst of a season of being isolated (laughs) and being selfish in a lot of ways. It's not that I didn't have meaningful relationships with friends and family and God, just that all of them seemed really far off to me at that point. Even when I made great friends in Lincoln, and I really got my career started, oh yeah, I did eventually get all my worldly possessions back, I couldn't shake still this profound sense that I was kind of adrift that I was alone without the necessary things to anchor me down and keep me grounded. And I felt daily in that season of life 
that if I would have just drifted off somewhere, that sure, lots of people would be sad that I wasn't around anymore, but that no one's day-to-day life would have been impacted all too much. That was just a little over nine years ago now. So let's fast forward to this week. I went to a conference this week for just three days in Orlando, Florida. And before you ooh and ah too much about me being in Florida, let me tell you what I learned. Apparently, and I did not know this, there are parts of Florida that don't even have a beach. Like, like, what the heck? Are you kidding me? It's like, isn't that the whole point of Florida is to go find a beach somewhere? Uh, Okay, not the whole point. Uh, Florida also gives us awesome news story about, awesome news stories about Florida man throwing an alligator through the drive through window at a Wendy's. It's a true story. You can look it up. That actually happened somewhere. Or Florida man arrested in local park for practicing karate on swans. <laughs> also a true news story. There were so many to pick from. I just picked out just a couple. You should look it up. Uh, they say that you can look up Florida man and then whatever your birthday is, and there's going to be a Florida man for that. That's, uh, uh, so. I didn't see any of that either, though. I mostly just saw the inside of a hotel conference room at the Holiday Inn. It was only five minutes away from the airport that I had flown in at. But it was an awesome conference, by the way. And trust me, I will talk your ear off about it if you ask me to. But when I got home last night from that beachless land of Mickey ears and humidity, after only three short days of being gone from home, I got an almost unbearable amount of snuggles. (laughs) I don't know if you noticed, I had to carry Theo out as a necklace after the children's time today. (laughs) But Mac and Theo were just attacking me with affection. They tried to cram three days' worth of shoulder rides and hugs and snuggles into the hour before we were (laughs) finally able to persuade them to go down for bed. But between those boys and all of our affection-needy pets, which Catherine just loves to gather in our house, I was under constant bodily assault until I left for church this morning. And that wasn't all. Even when I was on this trip a few days away from the family, Catherine and I would touch base every evening. And one night, after talking for a while, I casually looked down at my phone and realized somehow an hour and a half had flown by. We were talking, it felt like we were dating again, so much time just flies by like that. All of these things, these anchors in my life, these close connections and huge responsibilities that I did not have for nearly the first 30 years of my life have flipped everything upside down for me. When I got married, and again in a new way when I had kids, I had massive losses of personal freedom and expression. Can I get an amen from any parents out there? Okay, good. Uh, When I was a bachelor, I could make a decision on a Monday to leave later that day to drive to California with a buddy, and Mel maybe be back later that week. I did that, a round trip in a week, decided that day, okay? I could stay up all night, every night that week, and run myself ragged for an entire week, and then hibernate all day Saturday, and that was okay. I did that all the time. I could watch as many movies as I wanted or binge watch an entire season of a show in a day, which I did sometimes, or develop an out-of-character obsession with Sports Center for a couple of years, or, or running. That one actually didn't last more than a week. <laughs> <laughs> or trying to play the guitar. Uh, that one didn't last more than a month, which if you've played guitar before, you know that's like the perfectly wrong amount of time, because I was able to finally build up the calluses to where it doesn't hurt as bad. It hurts to play the guitar. They don't tell you that. But not long enough to like, keep any lasting skills at all. I don't think I could do one chord for you right now. Yeah. Uh, I also could drive a hitchhiker those extra com- couple hundred miles on a whim or take a stranger's invitation to talk theology in a basement for hours. Those are all things I did back when I was a bachelor. I could hunt down and suck the life out of any self-expression that flickered through my mind that day. I had both the time and the means. When I got tethered down by having to wait to watch the next episode of whatever show I'm watching until Catherine could too, when I got tethered down by the 6.30 a.m. wake-ups every morning with the boys, when I got tethered to the point where a three-day trip in Orlando meant I had to, like, pre-plan for stuff, which is, I'm really terrible at it. It's terrible. 
And not only that, pre-planning, but paying my dues both before and after the trip in snuggles and extra shifts with the boys. When I got tethered down to the point that I spent an hour and a half in Orlando talking on the phone with Catherine instead of renting a car and trying to find somewhere that had a beach, <laughs> get the heck out of the godforsaken Orlando so I could find a beach, or at very least find an alligator that I could throw into a Wendy's drive through window somewhere, <laughs> instead of what I did, calling the old ball and chain, <laughs> and then right afterwards falling fast asleep so I'd have the energy to be a functioning partner and parent when I got uh, on the other side of the trip here. Yes, ironically though, it was when I got tethered to the point of losing so much of that overflowing self-expression and freedom that I felt the very most myself when I lost all of that. Strange, isn't it? And those snuggles and in the hour and a half long conversations that felt just like a few minutes, those boring things that just anyone can do, those were the things that truly give my life shape and they give it meaning. Just nine years after curling up alone on my floor in Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> fighting a profound sense of loneliness that I could not seem to shake, now my life is overflowing with meaning and connection. And somewhere in this last nine years, I have gone from a sense of wanting to just drift away to really being face to face with the terrifying reality that what I do in this life <laughs> who I am and who I am becoming, it actually really matters, right? And it's not that it didn't matter before. <laughs> it definitely did. It didn't even matter less then. We don't get a pass just because we learn how to shut ourselves off <laughs> to the reality that what we do matters. Those things, what we do, who we are, who we are becoming, they were always just as important as they are now. It's just that when we don't have anything or anyone nearly so effectively serving as a reminder to that in our lives, it's easy to forget it. But having these close relationships, especially having people who rely on you every day, it roots you in that reminder that what we do matters and who we are matters. And this doesn't have to be a partner or kids. This can be a friend you take daily walks with. It can be someone you call regularly and check in on. I know some of our members, especially some of whom who have lost their partners in this congregation, have these sorts of holy relationships in this congregation with other people in our community. These connections give shape and meaning to life. Before I moved to Lincoln, I had a lifelong friend who served faithfully in this role for me, and that connection, along with being a new uncle, literally might have saved my life in that season. It's easy to think that the more tethered down we get, the more of ourselves we lose, but it's actually really the opposite that's true. And these close relationships can draw our minds to this idea of legacy that we've been talking about these last three weeks. The first week of this sermon series, we looked at where our lives have brought us thus far, how we came to our faith. And then last week, we remembered the legacies of those who have gone before us, the great cloud of witnesses who surrounds us as we try to figure out how best to serve God in our lives. A couple of you made me promise I wouldn't make you cry as much this week as I did last week, so I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to. So uh, This week, we shift our focus to the legacy that we ourselves are leaving. And this might be kind of a hard thing for us to think about, right? I don't often think about in those terms, what legacy am I going to leave? Uh, it's easy to get caught up in the responsibilities of life, those day-to-day -day things like the 6.30 wake-ups or whatever it is that's filling your life. And... It's easy not to step back and think about what story our lives are telling, but there are very few things that are more important than what story our lives tell. As someone who's done a lot of funerals for a lot of different types of folks, I can tell you that some people's legacies are a lot easier to pinpoint, to figure out, and then to share with others in a positive way. I can tell you one thing I've noticed is how well we foster relationships with others makes a big difference big difference in what kind of legacy we leave. Jesus came down from heaven with infinite power at his disposal, and he hung out with and became best friends with just 12 guys. And then after that, instead of doing these big things that most people would imagine he probably should have done, 
Yeah, he had lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. Sure, we get things, uh, you know, occasionally he'll preach to big crowds, but a lot of the stuff that we get, the record of what he's doing is he's just talking with people, making relationships. Legacy is built in relationships. Then we look at somebody like Moses, right, in the Old Testament, sort of the, the guy that did the big, big stuff, right? One of, our, one of our main stories in our faith, the guy who led God's people out of Egypt and sent these signs and wonders to plague the Egyptians who were ruling over God's people, who, with God's help and God's power, got those people set free. And the Egyptians changed their mind, ran after him, in this glorious finale of this part of the saga, through God's power, Moses parted a mighty sea. All of the people walked through safely. And when they were safely through, the waves crashed down on those pursuing God's people. Moses led God's people in through the wilderness for 40 years, made sure they were cared for. But still, he was not able to bring them into the promised land, the land that God had promised his people. And with all the great stuff that Moses did, probably the, the most important thing he did, or arguably the most important thing he did, was to raise up somebody who could follow after he was gone, that he could pass that mantle of leadership onto. That was Joshua's job, right? Because what would happen if they would have roamed around the wilderness for 40 years and then been without somebody to do that? And Joshua is the guy that we read about today. God used Joshua just before this part that Catherine read to also part a major body of water. He parted the Jordan River. Interesting, living into that legacy. And then after that, we see in the scripture, see 12 guys taking big rocks and setting them down and setting up an altar, a reminder to everyone who ever went there that God was faithful, right? It's a reminder that God is doing through Joshua what God did through Moses, and that's God's work and provision through the next generation. Set up that Ebenezer. Well, what, what's your Ebenezer going to be? What will be that thing in your legacy that stands for other people to remember? I think about that. I've been thinking about that a lot as I've been in this sermon series. And to be honest with you, I don't know what mine will be. Uh, through a messy process of trial and error, I'm pretty sure it won't be my running or my guitar playing. <laughs> Maybe not even my ability to watch Sports Center a lot, I, which I don't do at all now that I'm married. I, I know that those closest relationships in my life have risen up in me in this question of who I want to be. This is where I focus so much time and energy and love. I know they've given me a template for willingly giving up some of my own freedoms to pursue selfless love in my relationships. I know they've given me a reason to think about and work on what legacy I want to leave, to look inside and to try to follow God more openly and wholly, to try to live my faith out in the world around me. So today, this message is actually pretty simple. Build strong relationships, foster relationships that matter, leave a world and a church filled with those close relationships so that others can know God's love, and be intentional about the legacy you're leaving. And to that end, we actually, I don't know if you noticed, but when we passed stuff out today, you got a little extra booklet along with your bulletin, and that was with a purpose. The call to action this week is simple. We have given you a resource to start putting some thought into your legacy. And this is a little book that you can take and fill out at your own pace. It will remind you who you are and who you are becoming. And as you write, remember that. This is also a way of sharing your legacy with those closest to you. So I invite you, take time to read this. Catherine's going to come up and talk to you a little bit about the book. But I invite you to take time, read this uh, right in there. Be thinking about wh who you are, who God is calling you to be, and, wh and where you're going forth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead us in a little prayer. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together, God, to think about who you are calling us individually and as your body here. God, I pray that you would make us the church. <laughs> people filled with whole relationships with one another, with our families, with everyone we meet, God, so that people can know you, they can know your love, and they can be changed by it. In your name we pray, amen. Meaning of these books for me, about six years ago, 
Um, my dad, for Christmas, gave us a very interesting gift. I want to show you the book he gave us. It's called A Father's Legacy. Have you guys ever seen this book? Okay, there's A Father's Legacy, and there's A Mother's Legacy, and there's My Life, My Story, My Legacy. For those of you who aren't parents but are you know, are, have relatives and friends that want to know your story. And what my dad had done, a really hardworking guy, uh, every day during his lunch break, he had answered a question from this book. So this book is filled with probably hundreds of questions. Um, examples being, um, let's see, what was it like? What was your childhood like? How did you meet my mom? What's the most dis difficult decision you've ever had to make in life? Uh, what do you think uh, makes a man? And he had filled out this entire book for us. To this day, probably one of the best gifts I've ever gotten. Uh, and my sisters and I, there's, there's three of us, we fight over who gets to keep it in their house. Uh, because, you know, so often you get to a funeral planning session of someone you've known and loved, and there's questions asked, and you go, I don't. I don't know. I don't remember that anymore. You know, maybe the person that knew the answers to those questions is no longer living or they can't be at the meeting. And, and this isn't just for when you're gone. I mean, my sister and my dad's still with us, and we just love hearing his stories. There are stories we would have never thought to ask him that this book kind of prompted him to answer. And so I'm going to put these out right in the narthex area right there because these, you can find them on Amazon. You can find them at a local bookstore. You can find them at most Christian stores. Um, Christian bookstores, they have them. But Andy and I already have ours, uh, and I'm going to try to get started this week uh, because I think it's really important uh, for us to tell our stories. And this is a treasure. If you think about what you're leaving uh, that could exist, you know, grandkids, great-grandkids, or relatives and relatives and relatives down on the line. Um, so I just want you guys to consider getting one of those. But in the back of these books, uh, even though they're Christian, they just ask kind of vague legacy questions. So what I did this week spent some, a lot of time on it, I tried, uh, was make this little booklet. Um, so I'm going to encourage you guys to actually spend some time in it. So some of the questions I put in here are more focused on Jesus. How did you become a, a Christian? Who's been the biggest influence on your faith and why? What do you think your calling in life is? What do you hope or imagine heaven is like? What makes you feel closest to God? I want you to imagine that a friend or family member, uh, you know, generations down, finds this book. I know for a lot of us, when we talk about where our faith comes from, it's from someone that came before us that had a strong, strong faith. If they found this book and found your answers, could that not lead them back to church if they weren't already there? Or if they were there, more importantly, in a relationship with Christ, could it not encourage them up? Uh, it kind of feels morbid to fill out things like this uh, sometimes, but I just want you to think about, like, these questions will push you to think, and they're a gift to anyone that you love. So fill this out, stick it in your Bible. Uh, you could make copies of it. If you want to share it with Andy and I, make copies. We'd love to read through it. Uh, this is the sort of thing we love. So I want you guys to go ahead and work on that for me uh, and just keep it around. And if you know a friend or family member who would find joy in, in getting one of these, Ushers, would you do me a favor of unstuffing these from the rest of the morning bulletins and setting a pile out there? Uh, if we have extras, you're welcome to take one for someone you know and love. Um, and if you think you probably won't do it uh, and you want to share it with someone else, you can set it out there as well. Um, I now am going to move us into our time of offering. Um, and so inside your bulletin, you will also find this little um, piece of paper uh, that is the perforated piece. Normally, we have you check in this way. Uh, but this is actually, since this is our stewardship uh, campaign, this is actually our commitment card this week. So um, on the back, it says, leave a legacy. It shares our mission at the church. Come, be changed, change the world. And then you're supposed to share your name how you invest your time in our mission. So that's how are you going to serve or how are you serving? And then how will you support our mission by giving and how much will you give a week, month, or a year? Um, and so if you need time to think about it, you're welcome to take it home and bring it back. But some of you are already doing this and you just want to indicate it and stick it in the offering plate on your way out. That would be fantastic. Um, the good news is the church is in a really uh, good place financially and we're so thankful. Andy joked, he said, you know, we've been doing so well this year that we get to preach a Feel Good Stewardship Sermon Series about leaving a legacy. Next year, if you don't, 
You're going to get one of those give us money sermons. Uh, no, it's always good to, di- to get to remember uh, that stewardship isn't just about money. It's about how we live our lives and how we give our gifts and our spiritual gifts. Um, I'm going to invite Larry um, Clark forward really briefly. Um, he is in charge of finance here, and he and Joe have been working together, um, and they have a little financial update. So it's a half sheet, and it's also going to be out by these books. So for those of you who are numbers people and you're thinking, I need to see the numbers, that's important to me of how we've been doing, uh, you can pick one of these up on your way out. Um, otherwise, Larry's just going to give you a brief little report now. Thank you. Uh, one of the legacies that... Uh that I was thinking about during Andy's sermon when I wasn't nodding off was um, this church. Some of the strongest, sweetest relationships that I have had in my life came from church. I met my wife in church. Some of the dearest friends that we have made when we moved to Bonner Springs have been through this church. Our church has supported us in times when, uh, when we were having difficulties. And I'd like to think that we returned some of that when our friends were also having difficulties. So part of our legacy is this church. And part of supporting that legacy is through our finances. I wish Joe was here because, like my wife, who handles all of our money at home, Joe has done the bulk of the work (laughs) uh, in keeping track of the money. But I can tell you, this church has done very well. If you look around the conference and other conferences and other churches. There are many churches that have really struggled over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. Many have backed off from their mission. Our church did not. Largely because of the support that you gave and giving not only in money but in time and talents. Thank you for that. As, uh, as one of the leaders of the church, it's very good to know that we have that support. Now, that doesn't mean that everything was rosy. Uh, we didn't meet all of our financial targets this year, but we also didn't have all the expenses that we normally have. So through some hard work of, of your leadership, Uh, Andy and Catherine and Charles and everybody else pitching in, uh, we're going to be in good shape at the end of this year. Now, all of you know that prices have gone up. Everything seems to be going up these days. That means that it's going to cost more this next year to keep the lights on, to keep the heat up and in the summertime have air conditioning, and to do the basic mission stuff of our church. So the budget for this next year is a little bit higher than for 2021. Again, keeping within reasonable limits. Um, We're trying to support our staff and support the mission of this church as best we can, and we're looking to you to help out as you have in this last year. The, the conference has asked Andy and Catherine to take on uh, the work of working with the people in Edwardsville to help out their church. And it's basically uh, nearly a new church start over there. <laughs> so it's a lot of hard work, but I want to assure you that the conference is footing the entire financial bill for that. None of the money that you give to this church will go to that church unless you specify specifically that you want that done. So I want to assure you that when you give to the Bonner Springs United Methodist Church, it's used by this church. 
Now, as Catherine indicated, if, if you have an interest in the actual numbers, uh, Catherine has copied off some budget documents, and, and you can pick those up as you leave. I'll also be in the back uh, to help answer any questions. Ken Mortensen, uh, as head of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, has worked very diligently also with us all year long. Uh, any of us can answer your questions about the budget this year, uh, the coming year, so uh, feel free to ask. Um, and again, we can't thank you enough for the support that you've given uh, you at home and you here for the mission of the United Methodist Church of Bonner Springs. Thank you, Larry. I so appreciate your words. That's awesome. So a reminder, uh, if you fill this out, drop it in the offering plate. Um, now I'm going to move to our time of prayers. Um, so Charles has sent me those by email. This is what I have so far. Um, we want to be praying because Lauren Grant, who works with our children, her uncle Butch in Illinois was placed on a ventilator on Saturday with a bad case of COVID-19. Tyler Beats, this is a joy, lettered in varsity cross country as a freshman. That's great. Faith Dale, who's a little miracle baby, was born very premature. It's her fourth birthday, November 9th, and healthy as can be. And uh, we want to pray for Karen Grossman, who's been moved to Mid-America Rehab. Uh, rumor has it she wants to be back in church already, but they're telling her to stay a little longer. But that's a good sign. Um, and there are other uh, joys and concerns that we hold in our hearts today as we go to God in prayer. Let's pray together. God of love, we thank you that you're a God of second and third and fourth and fifth, <laughs> sixth, thousandth chances. God, we pray uh, that you would help us as we invite you to shape our legacy. God, help us to turn to you in the areas where we feel like we're not living in line with what we want to be living in line with. Help us to trust that you can transform us. Forgive us for the ways we miss the mark. And God, we also, we also just ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us. God, today I ask that you would help everyone in this room to believe that their life actually really matters and how they live it for you really matters. God, use their lives to continue to change the world that more people would know your love, your grace, and your salvation. God, we pray today for those people who are in our hearts who we hurt for and those who we celebrate. God, help us to represent your love to them. Help us to put feet um, to our prayers and to serve them in new ways. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One last reminder before we prepare to go and, and sing our last hymn is that the United Methodist Women did their holiday rummage sale. We thank them for, for doing that and for all of the, the money that they, they continue to, to raise for the church and the ways they serve the church. Uh, but there are still treasures for sale in the fellowship hall. Uh, by for sale, they mean they would like them to go to a new home today. So uh, one person said that it's as much as you can fit in a bag for 50 cents. There's some fun things in there. It's worth looking. I've seen some Easter, a little bit of Halloween, but mostly Christmas. Uh, and so the only thing that isn't take at your leisure and leave a, a tiny donation, you can leave a huge one if you want, but uh, the only thing that isn't that way is you'll find a little craft area, craft area where they have made um, some aprons, some pot warmers, some things like that. Those have prices listed. They've made those, so we want to honor the prices there. But the rest is kind of a free-for-all. So uh, Andy will race you there uh, and try to steal all the decorations that I will return next year to the rummage sale. <laughs> that is actually true. Like, a quarter of that stuff is stuff he brought into our home that I snuck out. It was a conversation. I'll just... <laughs> How in love with me did you feel after I did that? It 
was a conversation. We'll put it that way. All right. Well, let's uh, now stand and sing together, Here I Am, Lord, number 593. God, as we go out from this place, remind us that we are a called people, God. You love us no matter what. You call us to love others no matter what. God, I pray that we would be changed by your love so that we can go out and change the world. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>